Tonight, on the lost gold of World War II. There was a waterfall and something that looked like a monkey head behind the waterfall. I want to scour every vertical face on this waterfall. Oh, we'll just strip away the vegetation without even hurting a single leaf. It's like digital napalm. I'm freaking real. And you can fit 30, 40 people on here. Holy crap. There's markers on these rocks. For 70 years, legends have been told of a buried treasure, shrouded in danger. One of the great mysteries of World War II. Something very secretive and strange has got to be buried in that mountain. A covert operation led by the notorious General Tomoyuki Yamashita. Now, a team of Americans is on the hunt for this lost chapter in World War II history. There's something right here in this area. The question we have right now is, what is the best way to get inside this mountain? You will die. You will die. The Japanese didn't want you to find their treasure. We're not going to give up. there, Brad. Yeah, it's been quite a challenge. We moved some dirt here. Peter Struzieri and his partner, John Casey, are at the site of Breach 6, a large shaft they located after a tip from Grandpa, the local farmer, who says he saw Japanese soldiers carry mysterious crates into the mountain during World War II. They used my carabao to pull the boxes up the mountain. And then one day, I heard bomb. Breach 6 was allegedly dug by unknown treasure hunters, attempting to find a concrete tunnel system where Yamashita's men may have hidden these crates. The Japanese put the poison inside the hole. Grandpa says this poison killed the people who dug Breach 6. Let's get the excavator in here and tear it up. Let's see what that's made out of. Now, with Breach 6 opened up from the side to vent possible poison gas, heavy equipment operator Brad Carr will dig straight toward what they hope is a concrete cap that may be sealing a side tunnel dug by Yamashita and his men. All right, here we go. I'm going to punch in right now. Go for it, bro. I got you. Go ahead. What are you seeing? Uh, it does not feel white, Gandhi, at all. It's certainly not flaking off like concrete. It's like maybe like uh, sand or coagulated uh, mud. That... I'm going to pull back and so we can take a look at it. Copy. Go ahead. Certainly doesn't look like concrete, bro. Oh, man. Check this out. It's like it's... a clay or a silt? Silt. It's like silt. It's dried silt. Look at that. We decided to dig into this concrete cap. And lo and behold, it's not concrete at all. It's some sort of silty material. We expected to find concrete, didn't. It was kind of disappointing. You know, there's no side tunnel. But if it's not concrete, how did it get there? What happened in Breach 6? Look at that. And look at how easy it went in. Look at how sandy that ledge is where I took the scoop. And I could only pull back. How the hell would silt get in here? It was possibly deposited by water at one point. Evidence of silt suggests a large volume of water once filled Breach 6. It's one more piece of our puzzle. One plausible explanation is that over many years, rainwater washed silt down into Breach 6. 
but there's one problem. The silt is only concentrated in part of the shaft, as if it entered from the side. There's another possibility, a water trap, deliberately planned by Yamashita's engineers. In 2016, three men searching another site in the Philippines died when the shaft they were digging suddenly filled with water. It's alleged that Yamashita chose to bury treasure near water sources. Water would be contained behind a thin wall, and if treasure hunters breached it, a flood of water would be released. If it's possible that this is a water trap, we really don't want to screw with that. You break through that silt, it, a gusher could come in and fill this all up completely. Breach 6 seems to be laced with booby traps. Grandpa said that some people died down there. We found a possible cyanide bottle. It is a bottle. Look at it. Possible evidence of water traps. I think we need to find another way of getting into the mountain. With further exploration of Breach 6 on hold, Peter and John returned to base camp to discuss their next move. You know, we, we never would have found Breach 6 without Grandpa's help. Pete, we've really gotten lucky. I mean, if this hole wasn't right next to the pyramid, there's no way we would have found this except for falling into it by accident. What about that road that uh, you were following where there was the collapsed area? These rocks, even look at this one here. Look how it's just shattered to death here. What about, what about going back there? That was over here someplace. We'll never get an excavator up there. Try to dig it by hand, it'll take us forever. OK, so where else can we go? Well, look at this place. I mean, like I said, it's just so densely packed with vegetation. You know, no one's been up there since the Japanese were here. There's not a road, there's nothing. You can't yeah, see anything. Yeah, I know. I can see that. You know, even a regular drone couldn't see through the canopy. I mean, you look up, you don't see any of the sky. You just see leaves. There could be hundreds of treasure sites here. There could be thousands of clues. I agree. On this whole mountain here. What, what do you think the best way is to find those? I'm thinking about LIDAR. It's called LIDAR. It's called LIDAR. It's light detection and ranging. LIDAR is a highly accurate aerial scanning method that uses pulses of laser light to measure the ground and create a 3D map of the Earth. First developed by the American government, LIDAR burst onto the world stage during the 1971 Apollo 15 lunar mission, when astronauts used it to map the surface of the moon. Now the team hopes the same technology can help them scan the mountain and reveal additional treasure sites not visible to the naked eye. See the land, we'll see all the elevation changes, all the boulders, all the rocks, waterfall features, everything. Do oh, you, you know anyone that can uh, help us with this? Yeah, I've got a couple friends in the States, so I'll give them a call. I'm sure we can get them out here pretty soon. Give them a call, make that happen. Let's get someone out here. While John makes arrangements for a LIDAR team to visit the mountain, he also arranges for the team's head researcher, Bingo Minerva, to meet with one of his contacts who has also searched for Yamashita's treasure. I am in northern Idaho on my way to meet a gentleman named Rick Hurt, who was a treasure hunter in the Philippines about 20 years ago. I'm hoping he has any information about our site. Hey, Rick. Yeah, it must be bingo. Good to finally meet you. It is nice to Come meet you. Come a long way. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, no problem, man. Two decades ago, Rick was part of a group searching for treasure in northern Luzon and may have some information about who dug the mysterious Breach 6. So how did you get involved in treasure hunting in the Philippines? I was working for a State Department official that was in Manila. I was offered an opportunity to go to the Philippines for a base metal project. Now, while I was looking for the base metals, I had people coming to me. Are you interested in gold? Are you looking for gold? Then I found out about Yamashita's gold, you know, and then it started to get more and more interesting. I thought, well, I'm here. Maybe I should check into some of this. And about that time, I was introduced to a man named Colonel Coriasso. According to Rick, he worked with Coriasso, whom at the time was a Filipino colonel helping the Philippine government search for Yamashita's treasure. He had a map, 
and it was on a piece of cloth. I mean, Fairly it, old. It, it looked really old. It had some symbols that I didn't, I didn't recognize at all. So definitely Japanese origin. Yes. According to Rick, Colonel Coriasso's mission was guided by an old treasure map that depicted mysterious symbols known to have been used by General Yamashita. It is believed these symbols were a code devised by a secret group called the Golden Lily, a name chosen by Emperor Hirohito after a favorite poem he'd written. Run by his brother, the Golden Lily allegedly amassed treasure looted throughout Asia in territories conquered by the Japanese army. When the US Navy shut down shipping to Japan, the Golden Lily supposedly charged General Yamashita with hiding it. Could this have been a Golden Lily map? I'm pretty sure, yeah. On the map, it had a creek and a waterfall and uh, pyramid rock. Really? That's one of the reasons why I'm here today. We have a pyramid rock on our project. So is this the pyramid that you saw? Yeah, that is the pyramid I saw. Sounds like you're on our exact same mountain. Well, that's really interesting. So is this the pyramid that you saw? Yeah, that is the pyramid I saw. Sounds like you're on our exact same mountain. Well, that's really interesting. In Idaho, head researcher Bingo Minerva meets with Rick Hurt, a contact of John Casey's, who confirms he was treasure hunting on their mountain 20 years ago. Next to that pyramid rock is a massive hole. This is what the locals refer to as breach six. Wow. Did you dig this hole next to the pyramid? That was not there when I was here. Do you think Colonel Coriasso could have gone to this site after you had left? It's, it's a possibility. According to Grandpa, others have come to the mountain in search of treasure. But who actually dug Breach 6 remains a mystery. There were several gold locations in that area. Based on uh, Colonel Coriasso's map. Do you have a copy of this map? I don't. I don't. I wasn't allowed to take a picture of it. I'll draw it for you as close as I can. So the mountain was up here. And then there was the pyramid rock like that. Were there any trails at all on the map? There was a trail over here. And it looked like it was headed to a tunnel that had been blasted shut. That's just like Grandpa's trail. It's a pretty damn wide trail, too. Everywhere we look, just fractured rock. So what are some other features on this map that were shown? I mean, any other markers, maybe? And there was a stream that kind of came this way to a waterfall and something that looked like a monkey head-shaped rock behind the waterfall. You're kidding me. That's super interesting. I thought it looked more like a gorilla, and you could kind of see these eyebrow-looking things. It was amazing. Are you sure it was a gorilla behind a waterfall? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Well, that's kind of a huge lead for us. That's really strange. I wonder if that could be a golden lily marker. I bet the guys are gonna be really excited hearing about that. I'm sure they're gonna want to go explore that option next. The next day, Bingo reports back to the team about his meeting in Idaho with Rick Hurt. He says that Coriasso had an old Japanese map, possibly a Golden Lily treasure map. They had a lot of things on this map that were similar to the stuff that you guys are finding right now. What else can you tell us about this Colonel Coriasso? Not much. I was doing a bit of research on the guy, and I really can't find anything, but I'll keep looking. What about Coriasso's map? Well, here's the really weird thing. On the map that Rick drew for me, he found either an ape or a monkey face inside a waterfall. That sounds to me like that's a face marker. In my treasure hunting experience, face markers are really important because it's either looking at the treasure or the next marker to take you to the treasure. It is believed in the Golden Lily Code, 
face markers can be either human or animal and would be large in size, so they could be seen from great distances. Typically, the eyes were the most important feature, providing vital hints about the location of hidden treasure. This could be our, our next most important clue. Okay, we need to go and find that face. Remember when we did the flyover in the plane and we saw that huge waterfall? I think that's the best place to start. We should start at the top of that waterfall, work our way down. I bet you that face marker's somewhere in there. You take Manny, go up to the waterfall and start searching around there. Find me that gorilla marker. All right, I'll get Manny and we'll get going right now. I think the best thing to do is to go down the waterfall, check every single nook and cranny, and find this gorilla face. I want to scour every inch of this waterfall. I want to see this face. I want to know it's the real deal. Ready to rock and roll, Manny. Definitely looks like it's a lot smoother than the rest of the rocks here. It's hard to say. There's a lot of vegetation blocking it. I'm going to see if I can get a little closer. But it's so slimy over there, I don't know if I can get out there. I think I see like a... Holy Hold up. Holy smokes. It's OK. It's OK. It's OK. I'm good. I'm good. Been rock climbing for a lot of years. But once you get yourself out on waterfalls, it's really slippery, really dangerous. One wrong move, you could die. <clears throat> Hold on a second. You know, the rock that all the water's hitting is actually looking like it was carved out to some extent. It's like it has like an eye socket carved in it. I want to take a picture of it. Let me go down a little lower and see if I can see what it is. Look at that. What does it look like? Like a gorilla's head. That's carved in there. That's the one, Manny. Look at that. What does it look like? Like a gorilla's head. That's the one, Manny. Manny, I'm going to try to get around this bush here so I can see a little closer. High up the mountain, at the waterfall, following a lead from US researcher Bingo Minerva, John Casey has discovered what he believes to be the face of a gorilla carved into the rock wall. And where its eyes are looking may possibly lead him to Yamashita's treasure. As we look into the waterfall, I see some type of carving in it. It's like somebody chiseled a face into it. It looks good. I can actually see that the gorilla, it actually looks like a carved gorilla. It's got a definite eye socket and a face, a brow. It's definitely got a brow. And an eye socket. Which way is it looking? It's hard to say. There's a lot of vegetation blocking it. I'm going to try to swing over to, towards this vegetation, see if I can get a look around the other side of it. All right, let me know if you need anything. I was trying to get out where his eyeball was looking over there. But it's so damn slippery that I'm going to kill myself. You don't want that. No, I'm going to avoid that. Manny, take up the line. All right, John. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Manny, this waterfall is hiding something. We just got to figure out what it is. 
John heads back to base camp to share his findings with the team. So how'd it go up at the waterfall? Well, I have to say, it was pretty hairy. It was very slippery up there. You, you can't really manipulate yourself as much as you'd like. But I was able to rappel down and actually found the grill. Oh, look at that. That's just super. Now, the problem was is that, A, there's a lot of water coming down, and everything, as soon as it's I wet. I see the water coming, coming all around it. What was that? Well, it looks like teeth to me, the teeth and maybe the nose. And then the brow of the head, you can see kind of like a little where his brow would be, and then his eye socket. Can you tell me which way the eyes were looking? You know, it was really hard to say because it was so much water flowing over there, and it was so slippery. Once your boots got wet, forget it. You were, it was like being on marbles. It was just kind of scary. How do you want to proceed with this here? I think we should still look around the waterfalls and everything else, but I'm not going back up to this area until it's totally dry or the, this weather calms down. You really, you can't explore this anymore until the dry season. Following the advice of their eyewitness grandpa. What should I look for? Design, pyramid. The team has found several symbols that according to Martin, coincide with the golden lily code. A pyramid, a set of box markers next to breach six, a pack animal trail leading to a possible collapsed tunnel, as well as a possible gorilla face marker. But the team has yet to find a viable way inside the mountain. To help with their search, the LIDAR team arrives to conduct its aerial scan of the 5,000-foot mountain and hopefully reveal a potential opening. Hey, guys. <sighs> Welcome to the How jungle. How you doing? Good, yourself? Good to meet you. How was your ride? Nice to meet you. We're excited to have you guys here. Yep, we're ready to go. All right, All right. let's get the stuff done. Jamie and his team wrote the book on this type of technology. What they will show us will be invaluable to what we do on this mountain. There's so many places on this mountain that the Japanese could have potentially buried treasure or brought treasure to. And having that LIDAR here is the key to getting into the mountain. According to Grandpa, the Japanese army hid crates inside treasure vaults and then blasted the entrances closed. By scanning the jungle floor, the LIDAR technology will detect traces of roads and pathways that existed generations ago, possibly used by Yamashita's men to haul treasure up the mountain during World War II. So if, if it's here, we'll see it with that. A sensor with 360-degree vision is mounted beneath the drone. As it flies, it fires rapid pulses of laser light toward the ground, and then measures how long it takes for the light to return to the sensor. Collecting millions of measurements per second enables the LiDAR to produce a 3D map of the area. The goal, reveal what could lie beneath the dense foliage. We'll just strip away the vegetation without even hurting a single leaf. <laughs> nice. It's like digital napalm. All right, spinning up. All right, taking off. Right now, we're at 150 feet. When the drone reaches its cruising altitude, the LiDAR begins scanning the mountain gathering the data for its 3D map. Is that a road going across the top over there? Yep, that's a road. Wow. All right, ready? Okay. Scan the whole thing. I want to see everything. Don't, don't miss a spot. I want to see where the Japanese actually drove their trucks or had their encampments. Show me something really good. I want to see that where the, where the Japanese actually drove their trucks or had their encampments. Show me something really good. High on the mountain, the LIDAR team continues their aerial scan, searching for old trails leading to concealed tunnel entrances, where General Yamashita is believed to have hidden treasure during World War II. Man, that was pretty awesome, huh? Yeah, that was Just really imagine cool. all that data we're going to get. You guys just step back. Ah. 
Nice job. Thank you. We just used the best technology on the planet. And the data they provide with their LIDAR is going to certainly come in handy and help us to find this treasure. Later that day, back at base camp, the LIDAR team is ready to share their results. A digital map of the surface of the mountain with all the vegetation removed. Show us what you got. So this is the surface model we have with all the vegetation in the ways. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of vegetation. There's a lot Holy of it. Crap. And I will turn off that vegetation. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> that is sweet. So this is the bare earth model. This is just ground. That's unbelievable. See all the nooks and crannies, every elevation, every little runoff area. This is awesome. So if you think this is impressive, I actually took the time to digitize all the trails that I found. Let me bring Let's that up. Aha. So Holy there are the trails moly. in there. That is just more than I even anticipated we were going to say. That is just unreal. There's a hell of a lot of trails and roads, possibly, all over this mountain that we couldn't see before. The possibility of Yamashita's treasure being here, based on just what we're seeing, is phenomenal. So those trails, either if they were foot trails or foot paths, they just go up into the mountain and they stop. Why would it just dead end somewhere, especially into the side of a hill? This right here could be a cave entrance. What makes you think that it's a cave based on just what we're seeing? How the path that goes up to it, like right here. Well, there's a depression right here. We have to go up there and look at it to try to really understand what's going on there. It, it looks like it's actually like the entrance way to something. Yep. It looks like you probably could get in there. If there's a possibility that there's a pathway dead ending at a cave, I want to see it. I'm taking Jamie, we're going up there, we're going to find it. Using the LIDAR map, technician Jamie leads John to what they believe is the cave's location. Rocks are a little slippery, and it's a long drop off the side. Oh, yes. This looks like the entrance. I'm so happy that LIDAR picked this up. Oh, we're taking us months to find this on our own. So buried back in here. I'm freaking real. Oh, yes. Look at the size of this rock. Holy crap. Yeah, it's freaking. You could fit 30, 40 people on here. Look at the amount of soot on the ceiling. We definitely. Oh, yeah. We're making some fires in this place for sure for a while. Initially, the cave seems ordinary, but after inspecting it further, John believes it might house important clues. Utilizing caves like this is typical of Japanese military tactics in World War II. During the Battle of Peleliu in 1944, the U.S. Marines' amphibious assault of the small volcanic island was predicted to take only five days. But it lasted more than two months because the 11,000 Japanese defenders bunkered down in the island's natural system of caves. More than 10,000 Japanese soldiers were killed before it was over. A group of 35 managed to hold out for an additional 18 months, living in a cave, only surrendering in 1947, a full year and a half after World War II ended. You just imagine, you know, they had a back door entrance here, they got clean water access over there, you can go bathe in the creek. You got a good defensive position because you can climb up onto the top of this rock from the backside and look out over the valley, see if anybody's coming. And then there's, you know, like a plenty of room in here. Well, John, we're not just going to come in here and see a, a big treasure, like, lay in here. So right. what, like, where do you think it is? Could be underneath this giant boulder under here. And the other way they've set things up, it's big rocks and stuff. You move one out of the way, another one comes crashing down, and you're here forever. And like this rock that's balanced underneath here, it's kind of wedged in. So they could have moved these and put them in place. Thank you.
Holy crap. There's markers on these rocks. See, that's a couple of carvings right there. I start looking around the cave. I do a little further investigation, and right around the corner, there is the most amazing carvings, Japanese carvings, Japanese markers all over the place. Look at that. I'm in love with this place. I never want to go anywhere else. There's markers on these rocks. LiDAR technology has led John and Jamie to a concealed cave at the top of the mountain, possibly used by Japanese forces during World War II. Just inside the cave entrance, they've made an interesting discovery, a rock covered in strange markings. That's carving super cool. Right there. You got some Pick couple carvings that. right there. That is freaking unbelievable. Definitely a great indicator that they burying something around here. Wow, this is unbelievable. Love it, love it, love it. Dude, that's amazing. If you look at it through the camera, you know, it actually starts becoming a marker. John thinks these carvings seem similar to symbols he studied, allegedly used by the Golden Lily to designate one of their treasure sites. If I look close at the scratch mark, I can see the edges of where it's actually been scratched down as opposed to like a lot of these chip marks in it that are just chipped off. So that's giving me some indication that it's a marker. The more I look at it here, see a lot of this could be old Japanese carving in here. Look at the intricacy of what they've done. The carvings on this rock are amazing. We really need Martin to take a look at this and tell us what's going on. Does this cave connect to the tunnel system? Is there treasure in it? What's this rock trying to tell us? I'm going to get a picture of this for the boys, and they are going to be super stoked. Back at base camp, John updates Peter and Martin about his discovery. If we hadn't had this LiDAR data, we would have never found it. You could walk right past the opening to the front side of it and, and just walk right by it and not even know it was there. So, you know, it could have been a great lookout point or a, a, an outpost for the Japanese. Look, and what was inside the cave? Inside the cave was really interesting. There was this huge rock as you come in, and on that rock had different cut lines and cut marks and markers all over the damn thing. Yeah, hey, you take any pictures of it? I did. Yeah, how big is this rock? This rock is massive. You can see just by this picture, a big picture. This isn't even half the rock. You have found something very important. In my opinion, this is a story rock. This could be the key to Yamashita's treasure. Story rocks, or rock maps, are a common way to preserve a hidden treasure's location long after those who buried it have passed away and maps have disappeared. Unlike other markers the teams found, like the pyramid rock, or the gorilla face, markers which seem to have specific meaning, this story rock is not meant to be easily interpreted. Like cracking a secret code, it will require work to decipher. So, Martin, you've seen rocks like this before? Yes, I've seen a bunch of them like, like where? here. Down in yeah. Arizona, carved in there, some from the Indians, some from the Spanish. And they're telling the story of that general area and telling you how to go to the treasure. Now, this is going to be all probably Japanese, but. Um, so, this is like a treasure map then? Treasure map, and you got a story going along with it. So, you've got to decipher all of it to come out and get what you need out of it. It's going to be a little more mature than you think. So, we've got an awful lot of work to do right there just to figure out what it's going to say. You're definitely on to something. You know, you need to go back there with May. Okay. The next day, following Martin's advice, John and Manny head back to the cave to continue their exploration of the story rock. All right, it's a little sketchy through here. OK, so Manny, this is uh, the cave that the lighter picked out. But this, this is the reason. What is this? I mean, it is just glorious. And even all inside the rock here, there's all kinds of markers that are just, you know, now over time blended into the patina of this rock. 
And then you have, you know, all of these little markings on here to tell you what might be buried in here or around here. And a lot of these symbols may be telling us which way to go, how much was buried there, what was buried there, and where along the, this track it is. But it's treasure, you know, some kind of treasure. We have, I brought in the metal detector too, so if there was some big object down below you, you know, eight, nine, 10 feet down, the metal detector will pick that up right away. I'm getting something here, John. All right. Not, not on this one. When you get a hit, you'll know about it. It'll echo through this place like there's no tomorrow. I'm trying to do it. I think I'm getting something in the Please call too. I think I'm getting something here, John. Please strong too. In a remote cave, high up the mountain. John and Manny's metal detector may have turned up a new clue. All right, we dump it over here in our clean zone. What's in there? There go. It's a big rusty nail. It's an old rusty nail. It is a nail. OK, let's save that. Go back and scan that section. Right here. Yep, right there. Man, that's a big that's nail. Go ahead, swing back over that. Right here. Uh, you know, those nails are a good well, sign. Possibly coming from creeps. Although not the treasure they're hoping for, the nails seem to bolster Grandpa's claim about crates being brought up the mountain. They used my carabao to pull the boxes up the mountain. Boxes? Many of them. Hey, Pete, you have a copy? Yeah, I copy you, John. Go ahead. I found some really strange nails inside this cave. I mean, these nails are pretty heavy duty, and, you know, they could have been you know, what was holding together in Japanese crates, but they definitely looked like they could be from the war. Bring back as many as you can, copy? It's conceivable these rusted nails once held together crates filled with Yamashita's looted treasure. John's up at the cave right now, and it appears that he's found nails. We don't know whether they were building something or whether they were taking something apart. The nails could be a key factor in us finding the treasure. Have a look at this, John. What do you got? Look at this. Oh. This one right here? That is a giveaway marker. You know what that means? That means that this square hole here indicated that there's a box of gold. Just one there right could here? be a giveaway right under our feet. That's right. After years of researching Yamashita and golden lily symbols, John believes this symbol could mean a giveaway marker. Giveaway markers have been discovered at other treasure sites around the world. A giveaway is typically a nominal amount of treasure, meant to distract the finder from another even larger amount in the area. If the golden lily followed this practice, it's possible they may have planted a giveaway deposit with a larger cache hidden far below it or nearby. And this is telling you where and how far from this rock where it is. We find something to stick up in there. Here, it's like a little piece of stick or something. You stick it down in there, flush with the rock, and pull it out. So we've got about an inch of stick. Some generals use centimeters. So it's like three centimeters. Each centimeter would be a meter. If it's three centimeters equals a meter, then three meters away from that, pointing out here, there would be a box of gold. 
So definitely scan all the way across here and see if you get any big hit. Hey, Manny. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just having an epiphany here. Well, I'm leaning up over there, I see this mark. And I'm looking, and I see these cut lines in it, right across the edge. But it's also across from that one that I didn't notice before on the story rock, which is another marker lining up with the giveaway marker. So it's like a triangulation mark to tell you where to dig. Triangulation is a common method of marking the location of a treasure for future recovery. Three fixed points, usually distinct rocks or markers, are intentionally arranged in the shape of a triangle. Hidden treasure may be found within. So Let's see where it, where it would be. So it's coming from here. Right. Out to here. I'm going to use the shovel just to kind of mark the edge of it. It's definitely cut out of there. OK. And going back to the stick, John? Yeah. So it's giving us a triangulation back to this line. Yes, it is. Uh, Your treasure could be right here, in the center of this triangle. Look at that, my There's a chisel mark in this thing of an X. Is this a coincidence that there's an X chisel on the top of that rock? Excuse my French. What do you think it is? It's a marker telling us, get the shovel. We're going to dig right now. on the next lost gold of World War II. Somebody call for a bomb guy? But you're going to go into our cave with two sticks, a straight bladed knife, and a pair of big balls. All my years of treasure hunting, I've never seen X marks this spot. Hold, hold, hold. 